Coming up on Theater Talk. It seems to me the main thrust is how does Sondheim fit in with the artistic thought of the century exactly. that he rose in. Yes, I, I see him more as an artist of the 20th century and even of Western civilization because Dante and, and Goethe and people like that get a look in as opposed to simply, you know, the main guy of the American musical. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and Michael Riedel is out on the road somewhere, so I am so <laughs> delighted to be joined again by our substitute co-host, Jesse Green. Hello, Susan. Jesse. Tonight we are going to talk about yet another book from the most prolific of theater writers, Ethan Morden, who Hi. has just written... On Sondheim, An Opinionated Guide. What inspired you to write this book? I don't think writers are inspired to write books. It's just you're walking along somewhere and suddenly, oh, I think I'll do that kind of thing. There's a famous story that uh, Gilbert of Gilbert and Sullivan was in his study thinking, what do I write next? What could it be? And the Japanese sword happened to be hanging on the wall behind him, <laughs> a souvenir of I don't know what, and it suddenly clattered to the floor and he went, I'll write the Mikado. It's not, it really isn't quite that direct sort of thing. These things sort of creep in and there they are. So the muse comes upon you. It well, sneaks in. But there, there are, there's a whole cottage industry of books about Sondheim. Yes. This one's different. Well, this one is different. Uh, uh, but as you, whenever you got your non-inspiration, what did you decide you did not want to do, and what was, and therefore what was left to do? What I didn't want to do was an academic book. I'm not an academic. I don't like academic books. I don't think most people have much use for them. They deal in trivia, and they always talk around the subject kind of thing. There's very little in academic books. One thing I wanted was my book to be different from all the other books. So point by point by point, for instance, they are all done with Sondheim's cooperation, and frequently he comments you know, in the course of the book on what the author is saying. So no cooperation with Sondheim, although I used to know him, so I have um, uh, in my head and on tape certain statements that he made that I used in the book, but there was no cooperation. I, I, I didn't um, seek his aid at all kind of thing. So this book is a unique approach and exploration of Sondheim's musical. Yes, it does everything that all the other books don't, and it doesn't do anything that all so the other books don't. So it's not a biography. No, not at all. Though it's there's not a, a bibliography. It's not a discography. Right. It's, it's not a list of anything right. kind of thing. It, it's a, an attempt to analyze his shows in a way that no one has ever done before, in a way to bring both the neophyte and the jaded aficionado into the works more deeply than they've ever been before. Well, for one thing, it, it, there's no sanctimony in it, and that's partly because, as, in, as you said, it's sort of an unauthorized book. Uh, not that it's unauthored. But it, the uh, other thing is that each chapter is kind of a critical essay about one of the shows. Yes. Uh, with a few other things thrown in. And your insights are not the typical ones. You're, you are coming at this from various unusual angles. And it seems to me the main thrust is how does Sondheim fit in with the artistic thought of the century exactly. that he rose in. Yes, I, I see him more as an artist of the 20th century and even of Western civilization because Dante and, and Goethe and people like that get a look in as opposed to simply, you know, the main guy of the American musical. In making that assumption, are you making a claim for his importance as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and totally. In fact, um, people have said to me, you know, you don't seem to dislike any of the shows and they do it with this tone of like... <laughs> Even passion, you know, even, I do like them all. I like some of them more than others. They're all good. Once someone has reached um, uh, canon status, like let's say Beethoven, for instance, or Shakespeare, I think that, I honestly believe that artist is beyond criticism. Then it's just a question of how much you get out of this particular work and maybe how little you get out of that particular work. But you can't start criticizing them as if they were, I don't know, someone working today. Although he is someone working well, today. I meant someone else working Yeah, yeah, today. yeah, yeah. Any old person that comes Well, is there with. anyone else of that status working in the musical theater? There are major people. There's Candor and Ebb, although, of course, Ebb is no longer with us. There are major people, certainly, but I think Sondheim is unique. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in fact, let, let me add to that. I think he's unique in the whole history of the American musical. I used to think the unique person was Oscar Hammerstein. I really think all the revolutions that we talk about, the musical play and, and, and musicals with not, not just serious themes, but with, with really gigantic character interaction, like The King and I, yeah. which is why we keep coming back to them. There's so much there yeah. in a show like that kind of thing. You get a, a characterological panorama. All of that stuff starts with Hammerstein in the 1920s, even in silly shows, um, well, shows that we think are silly, like operettas, the desert song, for instance, the very notion that the heroine of the desert song, and a strong heroine, by the way, she kind of likes Pierre. He's so cute and friendly and so on, but he's, he's a little, what is he, namby-pamby. He's a little mo mollycoddle. And she loves and fears uh, the Red Shadow, the leader of the Rifts. And then it turns out, they're the same guy. <laughs> so what does that tell us psychologically about Margot, who's the heroine? That kind of thing. It all starts with Hammerstein. So I, for many years, I thought Hammerstein is the one. And now I think, interestingly enough, his um, mentee, Sondheim, is the one. Well, there's a way in which you posit Sondheim as act two of Hammerstein. Yes, um, and to an that, extent. And, and let's, let's uh, talk about, you were um, mentioning the importance of the show Allegro, a Rodgers and Hammerstein show, the first of their non-huge hits. Yes. But the first concept musical, you said. It yeah. is the first concept musical, and, which means we're now going to spend eight hours trying to define concept musical, so let's move right along. <laughs> but it's also what the French call their unidentified flying object. It's actually O, V, and I. <laughs> Objet volant non identifié, which means it's the work unlike all the other works. Even, um, let's say, Pipe Dream and Carousel have a lot in common, but Allegro is completely unlike everything else that they wrote, and in fact, everything else that was done at the time, 1947. But Allegro did not succeed at the time. Um, Allegro was the very first musical, as far as I can make out, the very first one where half the people you knew thought it was terrific and half the people you knew thought it was the worst thing I'd ever seen, which means you have to go. But How... e Ethan, which was right? Well, it's, it's hard to say because <laughs> it's a very flawed, fabulous uh, yeah. work. It's very, very flawed and very, very fabulous. Tell us the, the link there to Sondheim because it's not just that he was inspired by it in some way. Well, physically, it's because he, that was his first um, theatrical job. He was a gopher on the, on the show, on rehearsals, then he had to go back to college kind of thing. He told me, in fact, that he didn't remember the show all that vividly. But the link is, all right, we have to do the concert musical thing. In, in the concert musical, just to do it as, as briefly as possible, um, people can show up where they are not physically present kind of thing. People who are dead can show up and advise um, you know, other characters in the show kind of thing. Things happen at the same time that aren't um, geographically adjacent. It's one of the aspects of the concert musical. And think of company. That happens all the time in company. The other couples are constantly running on stage in the middle of something else that's going on. They aren't physically present in the story, but they are in the show because it adds that much more. Or think of the Liebeslieder singers, as they're called, in A Little Night Music, all constantly erupting into the action and occasionally playing a role when necessary. Two of the women play the two women in the little play within a play. And the concept musical is the link. If Allegro is the first concept musical, and the, what are the other great concept musicals? Cabaret, certainly. Cabaret. Love Life, which everyone has forgotten and that was a year later, and uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Chicago, and just about everything that Sondheim did in what I call his second period, which is from company on, yes. when he joined forces with, um, with Prince as director, Sondheim as uh, composer, um, lyricist. Well, That's company, Follies, Little Night Music, Pacific Overtures, Sweeney Todd, and then unfortunately Merrily, which did not succeed, but the others are all absolute classics. Probably everyone knows this already, but that Sondheim had been friendly with the Hammerstein since Sondheim was 12. Yes. And hung out at his house. Yes, and I think he regards Hammerstein as a lifesaver. Yes, because he was from a very you know, a broken and A broken home, home, but he was living yeah. with his mother with whom he did not get along. Yep. Yep. Always the mark of a great artist, by the way. Damn. Or, yes, <laughs> you missed out. <laughs> a broken home is not necessary, but a really crummy parent, absolute. Well, he, yeah, she, she took the cake, but... Um, Mine was worse, but let's move right along. Let's move right <laughs> along on that one. So Hammerstein was writing his big hits when Sondheim was first hanging around with him as a yes, child. Yes, uh, right? he had uh, Oklahoma under his belt. Of course, Showboat yeah. way back. Yeah. But Oklahoma and I think uh, Carousel, the movie State Fair. Yes, and then along came Allegro after they had already met. So what, what, what do you think brought Hammerstein around to this concept musical idea? I, I, and again, it wasn't it, called it's that. It's like, but... where do you get the idea for a book? Yeah. It, that isn't... It isn't one day Hammerstein says to Rogers, who didn't really want to do Allegro, yeah. quite frankly, um, let's do a show 
that um, it's a bare stage, but it's going to have 40 stage hands, which is more than you know most musicals had. Because there were pieces. This is something you no know, people. The few people who know about Allegro think it was completely bare stage. No, it had two traveler curtains. It had um, a, a, two levels of stage, actually three. It had a runway. It had not a runway, a thing that goes like that. I forget what, what it's called. And it had furniture pieces. But basically, the idea was it had a ballet space to keep it moving. Allegro, lively. It's about how fast life goes. How quickly life passes you by. Make your choices early and make them correctly, or you're going to find you're almost 40 and you've wasted your whole life. It's a little preachy, isn't it, Allegro? Yes. Yeah. All the great works of art are preachy. It's kind of built into the idea of the Divine Comedy is preachy. Commenting on the story. Beethoven's Fifth is preachy. What are they going to say? Oh, terrific! You're doing well. Then there's no show. Yeah. So the commenters are always saying, "Watch out! Yes. You're about to go off on a wrong." And that's track. the concept musical again too. There, are, it it analyzes the story as it tells the story. You know, in The Music Man, it's just the story kind of thing. Right. As I pointed out in the book, if, if I talked about The Music Man, if it had been a concept musical, how different it would be. The dead <laughs> father who haunts the little boy would be a character there. I mean, and no one no one can speak to him, of course, and he sings a song and he advises. And of course, in a Hal Prince production, the great moment would be when just for a second, Barbara Cook thinks she sees him, <laughs> but then he vanishes kind of thing. Because that happens in Carousel, you know. And oh, at the end, when Billy comes back, yes, to, yes there's a second where she, uh, uh, Julie comes running out of the house, and you see on her face, if it's directed properly, she does see him, but then quickly he's vanished, so to say, kind of thing. And he even says to the heavenly friend, it looks as if she saw me. So those people who did not like Allegro were enough to sink the show in terms of its profitability. Well, it got terribly mixed reviews. And you say that Sondheim said that he spent most of his career trying to work out the second act. Yeah, not okay. Sondheim, it's Cameron McIntosh. Oh, that's right. Jokingly said, you spent your entire career trying to fix the second act of Allegro. Well, of let, let's, let's play Sondheim a little more uh, specifically at this moment. So he goes to college. Uh, he studies music. He uh, is involved in the theater club at Williams and acts and things like that. And then he gets uh, a fellowship uh, with some money attached to study music after college with anybody he wants. And he chooses the most avant-garde of avant-garde composers there is, Milton Babbitt. Uh, you go on to discuss him as someone who is basically a classical composer who chose to work in a popular form. Exactly. And you know, Milton Babbitt himself nourished dreams of writing a musical for Mary Martin, as everyone did in those days. <laughs> Mary Martin, even more than Merman, Mary Martin was offered every role in a musical first. All through the 1950s and even, she's offered Funny Girl, she's offered My Fair Lady, because she had a wonderful range, characterologically. She was a, a, a absolutely fetching character on stage, and she could sell out during Holy Week. <laughs> and you put those three together, and that means you have a hit. Actually, she did have a couple of flops. But you, in fact, one of her shows closed out of town. It was playing in Boston at the same time as Oklahoma, when it was still called The Way We Go. Oklahoma went on, of course, to be Oklahoma. And her show, Dancing in the Streets, closed in Boston. Why do you think uh, Sondheim turned his back, let's say, on a classical career? Or was there even much of a classical career possible at the time he was making his... S certainly. Choice? I mean, all, everyone starts somewhere. You start in the 1940s, you start in the 1830s, or you start today. Yes, he could have, but the thing is he wanted to write music theater. And in those days, first of all, remember, there were no surtitles. There were no met titles. So mm -hmm. that if you're going to write opera, which is the music theater that a classical guy would write, it means the audience is sitting in there for three hours not knowing what's going on. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work for Sondheim. He... Uh, uh, as a great lyricist, particularly besides a, a composer, it's about the interchange of words and how the next line changes the scene entirely from what it had been before. You know, in, in the book, you are very persuasive, as you, as you are a good stylist, uh, in making the case for him as a, an artist to put up with the great artists we're familiar with in the canon, the people we're used to talking about as the great artists of the centuries. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with that. I happen to, you know, feel the same way. But isn't it a, a difficult issue in a collaborative medium like theater to pin that kind of label on one player in the creative uh, yes, work? Yes, you're right. It is. But it, it makes it easier to discuss kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. like when we say Verdi's La Traviata. I mean, there was a, a guy writing the so-called lyrics kind of thing, Piave. And we, don't, we never mention Piave. Right. We don't say Verdi and Piave's La Traviata. The composer bears the weight 
the composer, I mean, great lyrics, not good music, you won't have a score. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work the other way either, but it no one you have West Side Story where Jerome Robbins takes the credit. Yeah, it, it, again, it's very collaborative, and if you work with someone like Robbins, he's the muscle. Uh -huh. and everyone submits kind of thing. But that's not always the case. Sometimes the producer is the muscle. Sometimes mm -hmm. the star is the muscle sort of thing. But Sondheim himself, uh, I don't want to say he's humble, but there's a, he's, he's very uh, uh, insistent on giving credit to the book writers of all his... You know why? Uh, because you can't give away your credit. You can't. You can only be generous right. and, and you can be collegial, but basically everyone knows you're the guy that wrote that incredible music. So you're content to say when we talk about the greatness of company or the greatness of uh, uh, assassins, for uh, which is the kind of the end of the line of concept musicals. I mean, you have... You have uh, and John Wilkes Booth at the same time. encouraging uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to yes. murder Kennedy. I that's mean, absolute concept musical. Uh, you're content to say that's Sondheim. Um, well, of course, it's John Weidman, too, kind of thing. And he does, yes, he gives credit to his collaborators, especially because a lot of times the author of the book will come up with some marvelous scene. And you can just imagine him thinking, this is, I, I think people are going to finally know what a good book is. And Sondheim says, oh, I'm going to make that a song. <laughs> the same thing happened on Annie Get Your Gun. Um, Dorothy Fields and, and her brother Herbert were writing the book. And every time they came up with this great scene, Irving Berlin heard a song in it. <laughs> and he scooped it up and then it became a song. That's just the way the, what I find interesting about the collaboration is some of them are, can be quite stormy. You know, out of town, show is in trouble and everyone is screaming. Sondheim doesn't ever take part in that stuff. Sondheim doesn't like the screaming. He'll stand up for you know what he you know his his part in it, but he lets the screaming die down before he takes part. There there, there was, and I don't think it was ever shown here, a documentary on the making of Sweeney Todd in London when it first played London, not later, uh, at um, um, I think it was Drury Lane. Basically, uh, the the uh, guy who played the barber Pirelli. Yes, John Aaron he didn't realize that half of his role is going to be cut. He basically has mm -hmm. just one scene. It's that long thing where they have the contest. Right. It was cut in half in New York. Fine, it, it was too long as it was. John Aaron apparently didn't know about that. So the, doc, the, you know, the documentary, the way it works is there's a camera guy and he's following everyone around. And after the first two minutes, you forget he's there. So then there's this Geschrei moment mm -hmm. when John Aaron is told half your part is gone. And he's off to the side muttering, and, and Prince is off in another side. I don't care about the module. And I remember as I was watching this thinking, where's Sondheim? He has gone out for a snow cone because he's not going to take part in all this. And in fact, he had more to lose than John Aaron. John Aaron was losing half his scene. Sondheim was losing half his musical scene. The music that he well, wrote. Yes, but he had two and a half, half hours of other that's true. beautiful music. That, and that it was is true. Still, the it, same, is, it was the same melody. It is. That's true. It's not, it's not as if... But, but on the other hand, stuff does get cut that... Um, that, uh, for instance, Silly People, the song that always is cut from night music, is the essential night music yeah, number. Yeah. I could see, now it doesn't really suit the rest of the score and the scoring. Has anyone tried to put it yes, back in? Yes, um, one or two productions in England have done. Does it work? It, it, no, it doesn't work because, as I say, it doesn't match the rest of the music. The orchestra is this kind of growly. It doesn't. Song. It is, but not only that, it's the theme of yeah. the show. And it's, I know Sondheim must have put it in there to remind everyone about the idea, the smiles for the fools and the, smile, the night smiles and the smiles of a summer night is the movie that is the source of the show. He's reminding us of the important theme so that we know at the end when the, um, the old lady in the wheelchair mm -hmm. says the smile for the fools was particularly broad tonight. We have to have that back in our minds about it, that wonderful idea and it's much better in night music. In, in, the, in Smiles of a Summer Night it's a longer speech by a different character and it's kind of diffuse. It was um, uh, Hugh Wheeler who wrote the book to a little light music got it down just like this. It's perfect or maybe that was Prince editing who knows. But the point is, that's why the song is there. But it's slowing the show up just when the audience is... You want to get boy gets girl, and then curtain comes down. And that's the silly people. Silly people. That's why it's yes. gone. Well, you have to yes. kill your darlings. But, uh, kill your darling. The, um, you, you argue in the book for uh, Sondheim as a composer uh, in line with Ravel and Rachmaninoff and figures His like favorites. that. His favorites. And, you, you know, if you listen to that music and you listen to him, you hear it. You don't hear much Babbitt. At least I don't. <laughs> uh, none. none. But Babbitt was often, you know, that, that was a time when, because of academics and critics, all of America's composers were forced to write yeah. what is known as very modern music, either 12-tone or at least simply atonal music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of them have said, now that it's all over, 
I would never have written the stuff I wrote if I wasn't for if I hadn't been forced to. Thinking of Sondheim as a dramatist, which is how you categorize him in terms of the writing of his songs, there, uh, and also the vision in which he places those songs. Even though there is a book writer and a director, you still see him as a, a musical dramatist. It's the same way that Verdi is of his. It, right. it, it, that's how it works in music theater. The composer really is. For instance, let's say a composer and a librettist are writing an, a lyricist are writing an opera, and the lyricist says, "I see a scene here where she," and the composer says, "No, she going to." He wins. It's the music. The music is in music theater. The music is number one. Everything else is secondary. So who are the figures that Sondheim lines up with in the theater, uh, in the way that he lines up with Rachmaninoff and, and Ravel? In I don't music? think I, I, he's unique. There, there's, no, there's no way to... Not even know. Hammerstein. No, because again, Hammerstein was a, 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 a librettist and yes. lyricist kind of yes. thing. So they're working in a different kind of... Each is working in a different way. Yes. To on, even on the same shows, if they'd worked together, let's say. Let's just say Sondheim composed and Hammerstein wrote the lyrics. It, there's still two different forces two, and two different worldviews, too, kind of thing. But do you see any connections to uh, non-musical dramatic figures of the time that he was coming up in? No, I don't, but I, I do see certain um, uh, parallels in the book. For instance, in, in Company, for, um, I think a lot of those very strange lines that you hear at the beginning uh, when the party is assembling, mm -hmm. They remind me of Pinter. Very yes, much. I was just going to say, the, and, and, and the and, birthday party. And. Yes, and, and the thing is, I, um, George Firth, who wrote the book to Company, was an actor and very into theater, and he was living in New York at the time, so he must have seen those first productions, as I did, by the way, although I was much younger, um, of Pinter that were done, the birthday party and the homecoming. You speak of the ambiguity in Sondheim, which is n not previously accepted in the musical theater, but, that too. Say, but ambiguity is accepted in Long Day's Journey and Tonight. Absolutely. And other classics. Yes. But, but Well, one reason why it, it doesn't work in the musical, or at least was thought not to work in the musical, is when you add music to anything, it emphasizes it. And if, if a play has ambiguities and, and whatnot, and you start putting songs in, the ambiguity goes away because the music sort of, say, maps the characters for you. It, 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 it kind of stabs them into place as a butterfly collector does, those poor little things that he has to put in his stupid book. So, in other words, it, it's hard for musicals to have, um, they can have irony, and Sondheim's, have, uh, Sondheim's musicals have loads of irony, but it's hard for them to have ambiguity, because the, you, you can't have ambiguous, I mean, you can have ambiguous music, but you can't have amb ambiguous lyrics. Well, I guess you can, sort of. It's very tricky to bring off. So even someone who's very well-intentioned and brilliant can fail at that. It's, it's very tricky to pull off that kind of stuff. I think that's why there are, there are no shows like um, company. There are no shows like Pacific Overtures. It's not that, all right, the Kabuki musical has been done, let's do something else. It's that the, the directions his works go in are so, they go into uncharted territory. And no one knows, that's why I think we have to keep going to them. We can't collect them in one or two viewings. We want to find a, Gypsy particularly, Gypsy is so brilliantly written that a lot of it isn't there, so to say. Mm -hmm. You have to fill in the details. You are given everything you need to know. But there's all sorts of stuff, and company particularly. I mean, how did he meet those people? How did he meet Joanne, the mean girl sophisticate that Elaine Stritch plays? You know, but what are their jobs? We don't know anything about their jobs at all. And they talk, occasionally they talk about having kids. We don't see any kids kind of thing. It, that you, you are given the information you need, but you're not given all the fill. And most musicals give you fill. Most plays give you they fill. Too much fill. Yeah. And a dream ballet. We have one minute left. Well, the w one thing we haven't really talked about that we, you, you can't not talk about with Sondheim is the lyrics. Lyrics are all often considered, an, you know, one of the many bastard stepchildren of musical theater, but yeah. n you can't really approach his work without talking about the brilliance of the lyrics. Not just, I don't just mean the formal wit, you know, which you can analyze all you want, the internal You line. mean the playwriting? The, the playwriting. playwriting lyrics, yes. And he, he, for instance, doesn't like those typical musical comedy songs where nothing happens in the song over and over again kind of thing. Like, then you may take me to the fair from Camelot. He specifically, because it's the same thing three times, mm -hmm. and then the three guys come in and sing it all again kind of thing. Although it's a wonderful song, and Camelot now, it's, it's, the song is back in. People don't want to do yeah. without it. Kind of. he, his, I think one of the reasons why some people had trouble getting his music down is the lyrics travel so densely through a song that you, ha you have to listen to them because things are happening, you know, and you can't take in the music. 
You've got to travel along with Sondheim as he unveils these new ideas in his lyrics. And once uh, that review showed up in the late 70s, the one from, from Side by Side by Sondheim, mm -hmm. then you, it was just songs by themselves. And you could sit back and listen to the music and you thought, boy, these are wonderful. Why didn't I like them the first time? The reason why is you were following the playwriting of Sondheim through the music. And that's why you couldn't collect the music that first time. Ethan, we could talk to you all afternoon, but alas, the clock is, we're done, we're done. Thank you so much, Ethan Borden. On Sondheim, an opinionated guide, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, Jesse. Thanks, Susan. And thank you, Susan. Liaison, what's happened to them? Liaison. Disgraceful. What's become of them? Some of them hardly pay their shoddy way. What once was a rare champagne is now just an amiable hock. What once was a villa at least is digs. What once was a gown with train is now just a simple little frock. What once was a sumptuous feast is figs. No, not even figs. Raisins. Ah, liaisons. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.